Welcome to week three of our class and we're going to be talking about multimedia learning theory and do some hands-on activities with screencasting and making those screencasts interactive. This is an outline of what we're going to cover today. But before we get going, uh, this can be a bit of a stressful time with COVID and uh, early in the semester, so let's just relax a little bit and take a deep breath. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about multimedia learning theory. It is a cognitive theory of multimedia learning based on three main assumptions. The first one is that there's two separate channels, both auditory and visual, for processing information. The second assumption is that there's a limited capacity in those channels and that those channels can get overwhelmed with uh, too many visual inputs or too much auditory input. And third, that learning is an active process of filtering, selecting, organizing, and integrating information. And you can see on this chart here, we start with words and pictures going into your ears and eyes that are move into working memory. And if you have enough time, or if a person has enough time and uses enough mental effort, they can integrate those new words or images uh, with prior knowledge and move them into long-term memory. And that is an active process, that integration to put things into long-term memory. And like I mentioned before, if you have too many things coming at you, you don't have enough time to do that active processing and things will not get into long-term memory. So here's just a, another visualization of the same thing. You can see that this person's looking at their screen, they're seeing things, they're hearing audio through the speakers. It's going into their ears and eyes um, and into working memory. And then if the person has enough time, they'll be doing an active process of correlating what they're, they're seeing and hearing with things that they've already heard and moving that into long-term memory. Again, if they have enough time to do that and if they expend the mental effort to do that. Here's an example of, in practice of what to do and what not to do in, a, in terms of a PowerPoint presentation. So on the right here, we've got a block of text and some people, as you've seen in presentations, they'll read all of the text off the screen. That's typically not the best way to transfer things into long-term memory because you're encoding the same information into two different channels. So you're reading it with your eyes and you're hearing it through your ears. And counterintuitively, it's better to see a visualization of what's going on and then hear the text, the text narrated rather than having to read it again. So for example, if you had, if you wanted to talk about bears, you wouldn't have a wall of text talking about bears. You'd probably have a picture of a bear and her cub, and then you'd narrate what's on the side. And that images and narration makes it easier for people to make connections with what you're communicating and move that into long-term memory. A hands-on example related to, the dual related to this is the dual coding theory of sketchnoting where a listener engages in both the verbal and visual parts of the brain to summarize important information and concepts into meaningful diagrams and text. So here's an example that I created a while ago, and there's good uh, research to show that uh, instead of typing notes into your computer, trying to type the, the most complete notes as possible, uh, people remember better if they summarize in their brains what they're hearing or seeing, make little diagrams, uh, and they don't have to be pretty, just diagrams that are meaningful to the person, and then uh, annotate them a little bit in meaningful ways as well. And the drawing and the annotation uh, results in better recall than if you're taking uh, notes on your laptop and trying to make as thorough notes as possible. And we're going to be doing some sketch noting in a few weeks from now, so I'll, I won't go into this into too much detail today, but wanted to bring this up now just because it relates to multimedia learning theory. So TeacherTube, Khan Academy videos, YouTube, uh, 
Have you used any of these in your, your personal learning? Most people have used some of them. At the very least, YouTube, sometimes Khan Academy, TeacherTube might be too new, new to you, but it's a wonderful resource. Although these are all wonderful resources that can supplement what you're bringing to the classroom. Again, it will depend on what ages you're, uh, you're going to be teaching, but there are videos that cater to almost all the age groups in K-12. So what are some pros and cons for using video in the classroom for a type of homework? Well, one of the pros would be it differentiates learning in that it allows the learners to move at their own pace. Um, if there's someone who's maybe struggling with their language skills, if you have a, a student who's new to learning English, they might be able to repeat the videos in terms of YouTube. They can slow them down. They can put closed captioning on. And uh, like I mentioned, they can repeat it. So this is one way to differentiate the, the speed of, of learning. Whereas if you are presenting something in a classroom, some people might uh, think it, you're going too slow. Others might think you're going too fast. Moving some of the instruction into video format can get around that. It also can uh, facilitate what's sometimes called flipping the classroom, where the instruction becomes homework so that there's more time for hands-on activities in class. Again, there's more scope for doing that in later in middle school and high school, but you might be able to do a little bit of this in elementary school. And it also helps uh, your learners to figure out how to learn a little bit more on their own, uh, especially, uh, especially helpful in inquiry type projects or free inquiry projects in particular. So as with all things, what are some of the cons to uh, using videos? Uh, one that I can think of is that watching videos might be isolating, um, especially in the time of COVID. We're spending a lot of time in front of our screens right now videos might add to that sense of isolation. Another thing is distractions. Because they're on their computer, they could get distracted by things popping up on their screen, notifications, or just in YouTube in particular, sometimes there's videos that they uh, that YouTube will put on the side that are off topic that could uh, get their attention rather than the instructional videos. Another negative is there may be issues with uh, access the availability of technology for learners in their house. Um, it may not be a problem in some, for some people, but if there's only one computer in a house and there's several people needing to use it for work or homework, uh, students may not be able to watch the videos very easily or there, it might introduce some conflict into the home uh, about that. So anyways, the other thing uh, I probably should mention too is it needs to be age appropriate. Um, Educational videos, uh, are you're not going to be using them as much with the kindergarten class as you would with grade 11 and 12, for example, for obvious reasons. So what is flipping the classroom? Uh, I think we've talked about that pretty much already, but basically flipping the classroom is moving instruction into a video format or a reading format so it can be done before class so that class time can be spent doing hands-on activities. So if learners get stuck or have questions, uh, you as your teacher can be there to help get them unstuck or help them move on. As well, they can help each other. Uh, oftentimes, if there's a student or two that are uh, are already familiar with the, the topic or the technology, they can help their peers as well. One other uh, thing to consider with flipped learning is that it takes a significant amount of preparation for instructors who create their own flipped curriculum. Uh, you don't have to create all your own videos. There's lots of good videos out there already. I tend to only create new videos when I can't find something uh, appropriate or that I think is a high enough quality for my class. The other thing to keep in mind as well is just because someone's flipping the classroom or they say they're flipping the classroom doesn't mean that they're actually doing it well. Uh, for example, the pre-class videos uh, need to result in more active learning time in the classroom to really be more successful. So when should I make a new class resource? I think I talked about this a little bit already, but when there's no resource available that'll do the job, uh, or possibly if I just don't 
I'm not familiar enough with the the technology uh, to make a good video about it myself. I'll I'll look for other people who have done a good job already. The other key thing is how do we evaluate the resources that others have created? So if you're if we're not an expert with the the topic or the technology, uh, evaluation of resources can be difficult. So I tend to look for resources from trusted organizations, from other universities, other professors. Uh, for K to 12, it would be other other teachers, for, uh, people that you're familiar with that have good reputations, and spend a little bit of time to research that. So speaking of flipped classrooms, uh, we will now get into our hands-on time and make a screencast of a website uh, or a game that a web-based game that uh, you're familiar with and like, and then after that, we'll put it uh, put it on your blog and use H5P to make that video interactive.